Okay, let's go ahead and get going. So what we want to do today is actually show you a couple different ways of doing rendering. Um, one just sort of just uh, to set the stage, kind of look just directly how we do the rendering in Revit, but it's really just a starting point for what's going on. There's some really some what I think are some better ways for doing rendering, including a very fantastic tool we want to show you today called Showcase. And just so you can sort of think about it relative to like the whole range of different rendering products, things like Revit and Rhino are all about kind of creating the basic forms. And in Revit and Rhino, we have some very basic rendering tools built in there so you never have to leave the product. You can just sort of do some quick renderings right there. Yeah. What we typically do is at the tail end, take those models out to sort of more high-end rendering programs that have better lighting controls, better environmental controls, let you really create much more photorealistic things. And the standard for doing this for years has been something called 3D Studio Max. And Christian's going to show you that next week in terms of really going through and the ins and outs of using 3D Studio Max, get it all on these machines. But what we want to show you today is actually something called Showcase, which is a little bit of a hybrid crossover where it was originally designed to sort of support rendering of products, things that would be like product design features and sort of illustrated kind of from that standpoint. But it actually turns out to work out very, very well for architectural renderings. And the way to think about it relative to all those things is, okay, Revit and Rhino rendering within kind of oh, on the fly and relatively rough around the edges. Okay, Showcase really uh, has a very high-end rendering engine. It's using the same rendering engine as 3D Studio Max, but it does it in sort of a very interactive way. So you kind of drop materials on and you immediately see the impact as opposed to having to say, let's render now and then wait as an image is created for you. Okay, and then 3D Studio Max, that's really still the high end when you, so if you want quick results and you're gonna experiment with materials and try to get a feel for what things are like, you know, Showcase is a better tool for doing that very, very quickly, whereas 3D Studio Max is, that's the, the tank when you really wanna go ahead and get like uh, everything put together. But just so you guys can play along, if you can do this on your machines, please do. If you go out to the L drive, I actually set the installers up there, and we might as well just sort of get these things installing in the background as we go. So if you go to the L drive and go to the 133, 233 folder, and then what we're going to do is run one of these different showcase installers. Now, showcase is one of these things. You can install it on your own machine. If you go out to the Autodesk or students.autodesk.com, download a version. They have a 32-bit version and a 64-bit uh, version. I think if I'm looking at your machines, almost all of you are on one of the older machines that still has XP on it. If you're on a machine that's using XP, install the 32-bit version. If you're on a machine that's running Windows 7, install the 64-bit version. Or what's going to happen as soon as you sort of like try to install it, it'll tell you if you have the wrong version. But go to Showcase Installers, double-click on that, and then whether you want 32-bit or 64-bit, go ahead and just double-click on these things and follow the path. And what's going to happen is when you do that install, It'll take a while and upload some files and initialize. It'll finally get to the point where we'll want to do some sort of licensing. And at that choice, you can choose on your own machine, set it up so that you're going to put in your own serial number. On these machines, just set it up as a 30-day demo just to get us going today. Actually, we have all the new licenses for all the 2012 software. It just hasn't been installed on this cluster yet. I think it's upstairs on all the Cypher machines right now. So it's just waiting to be deployed down there. Here, And that's actually something that has to happen this coming week in preparation. So you have... Exactly. Wouldn't that be nice? You actually have consistent software across the different things. So we'll go ahead and make that happen this week. So if you can, just go ahead and get Showcase or start and Showcase installing on your machines because, you know, if you want to play along, don't worry if you don't, you can sort of watch along too. It'll all work. But just let's kind of get that going. And as that's kind of cooking along in the background on your machines, let me go back to Revit and just real briefly review rendering there and kind of how that works. So I am popping back over to Revit, and in Revit what I'm doing is I'm actually opening up a file that's called the sample house file, and this is the one that just sort of standardly gets distributed to illustrate just the notion of really how rendering works and how you can sort of set up a, well, just work with a product and start understanding what a BIM model is all about. And it's kind of an okay little one. If you actually want to open the same one, it's under, if you open and you open a project, and if it's not in the high level of the menu, you could always get to it by, it's under... I always have to find it. I think it's under like C and then I go to program files and I'll find Autodesk and really I'm just tunneling down to where Revit's installed. Revit architecture, data, actually it's not in data, where is it? I gotta find it, trying to program samples. 
Okay, and then you'll find basic sample project, and that's the sample house. So if you want to open the same one, you can, or just open your own ribbon project. It doesn't really matter to me. Go ahead and just have something up that you can kind of play with. So as we're working in Revit, people are sort of used to the idea that, okay, we got these different 3D views. They're kind of okay. And typically when we want to do rendering, you know, the idea is to set the camera to where you want the camera to be and then kind of turn on the rendering settings and go. So in terms of setting the camera and the views, you know, most people are familiar with this kind of 3D view and navigating around. So we have a 3D view and I can orbit around or use the view cube to kind of change to some different kind of classic orientations. And that's kind of a great starting point for getting going. Another thing we can do is actually go through and set up these perspective views. And that's often what you want to do to kind of create a nice rendering because these helicopter views are okay. They're good for axonometrics, but they don't really show you a lot of kind of the interior detail. And setting up camera view was just switching to a floor plan or any of the plan views, going to the view tab and just choosing a camera from the 3D view tool. Then we can go through and choose that, kind of pull on out, and create some sort of 3D view. Now, these sorts of 3D views look okay in terms of what's going on. We do have the ability to kind of control them a little bit, and people don't think about it very much. We can do things like with that little steering wheel thing, that little widget, we do have the ability to kind of, oh, we can kind of keep on orbiting around and things like that. Let me actually switch it. It has several modes. This is the basic mode. I'm going to switch to the full mode because the full mode will actually let me do things like, oh, look, which will keep me in the same position, keep my camera in the same position, but I'm just sort of orbiting around what my target position is. So I can kind of get to a slightly better view there, whatever it is that I want. I can also do things like walk. We don't tend to play with that, but if you got used to the idea of the, the walk arounds and the uh, uh, just the walk through animations, you can use the walk tool to just sort of push ahead or push back and try to experience the building a little bit that way. And this is still pretty clumsy. I don't think this is sort of a great way to do it, but at least it'll help you if your camera is about right, but it's not quite right. You can sort of do a little look or a move around or something like that to kind of get it to where you want to. Kind of something that got added to the latest release of Revit, just sort of really quick and dirty cheap rendering is under the visual styles, there's actually now a realistic choice. So on most of your machines, since those still have Revit 2012 or 2010 on them, this choice won't be there, but let me just kind of turn it on. On mine, this is a newer version. Realistic will go through and just based on the image maps, okay, based on a little bit of the shading and whatever is like, these are sort of shaded surfaces. The chimney you can actually see has some sort of bitmap that it's trying to apply to it. It's going to give you a little bit of this sort of more feedback about what the materials look like. And that's kind of a start. Now, putting the camera in the right place is kind of a good thing. I want to show you one other kind of cool trick just in terms of working with this, you know, to kind of create better and more creative views. And that is the whole idea of, don't forget about the whole notion of the section box. Because the section box is like one of those like hidden gems that we sort of forget about. And the section box works like this. You know, even as we're looking at this, here, I can tell there's a little bit of section because the ground plane is kind of cut off on the edge. But how that works is if I'm in a 3D view, and really any view, any 3D view will do it, there's this choice called the section box. You can see it actually is turned on in the default 3D view. I can't see it right now, so that's kind of a clue to you. Okay, it's here, but it's actually hidden, okay, which is a little bit strange. Let me go back and I'll look at sort of what's hidden. And if I reveal the hidden elements, you'll see, ah, it is there. It's just hidden. Let me unhide it. And the nice thing about seeing that section box, and don't worry about it, it won't render, it won't get in the way, anything like that, is it'll let you really quickly do these things like kind of cut different views and start seeing sort of more interactive 3D sections. So that's kind of a cool way of just sort of experiencing the model. Now, the section box works not only for like these uh, the metric views, it also works for the perspective views. That's really cool. And you can control it kind of from any of the views. If you have a floor plan or an elevation plan open, you can still sort of, you know, kind of control things. So I got this 3D view. Let's try some sort of classic things people try to do. So for example, let's say you want to have a floor plan view, but a 3D floor plan view. What you can do is this. If you go through and we've got that little 3D view open right now. It's going to sound weird about where it is. I'm not sure why it's here, but if I right click on the view cube, 
you'll find something that says orient to view and I can choose one of my floor plan views and what it'll do is it'll take that 3d view and kind of cut it and reorient it and basically what it's now doing is it set the section box so it matches the same parameters as the floor plan view so it has the same view range cutting at the top and bottom so it's kind of a really kind of quick and dirty way of getting to sort of these 3D axons. And the nice thing with something like this is, I can do it for the second floor, then I can do another one for the first floor and start stacking them. And I start having, you know, exploded axon metrics, which is for a lot of people a really attractive way of illustrating either the vertical stackering or the stacking of the layers of the materials, whatever it is that you want to sort of show. Okay, so all these views, if I have this, and that's great, that's gonna be my 2D, uh, 3D view or second floor 3D view. I can duplicate that. And I can start stacking these things. Oh, 3D, second floor, hang on. Jeez. Every once in a while, my little keyboard goes crazy on me. I'm not really sure why that is. Yep, it's doing it to me right now. So I'm gonna do it over here. Let's try that. Okay, 3D. No, well, forget that. I won't be naming my thing because I don't have any control over my keyboard, but I'll figure out what that is. That's a whole separate issue somewhere. I don't know. My, my, my machine is possessed. Okay, once we go ahead and we have some views, another way to actually use it though is in the axonometric views. Let's just kind of show you that way or in the uh, perspective views. If I go back to that perspective view, let me even find where that thing went to. There it is, 3D view one. Yeah, it has a section box too. So if you want to do it in these, it's the same sort of thing. Go to the 3D view properties. Just turn on section box. Okay, it is there. It's a little hard to control in this view. You can, it's kind of hard to see what's going on. So you may want to go through and, well actually, this will work a little bit better. It's almost if I tile the windows because I'll be able to see them both simultaneously. Got a little bit too much going on there. Let me kind of close out some of these. Sure, I don't actually care about that one anymore. Close that one up. Okay, let me tile these again. Because what I want to do is basically be able to sort of select that section box over here. And then you can sort of see it in this view too. And the reason I like to do that is I can then pull the edges in and kind of like section it so I'm cutting through the building right there and it'll sort of show it over there. And then I get more of this like, a, you know, in a lot of ways, that's not a bad view. That's sort of a compelling view in terms of understanding what's going on with the construction and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So in any case, you do all this stuff and then after you set up your camera, what we typically do is we go to the render tab, we go to show rendering and we choose some settings in here. And hopefully if we've set up our materials and we've got everything set up right and we got our lighting set up right, we're gonna get a reasonable rendering, rendering and we either go from draft for sort of very quick renderings to sort of just understand, do we have the right materials and approximately the right lighting or we ratchet it up to a medium or kind of a higher level rendering. And as we do that, the resolution gets a little bit better. Also the lighting quality gets a lot better in terms of bouncing lighting off the different surfaces. And that's especially important for like interior rendering. So let me kind of, just, since this is relatively quick, turn that up to like medium instead, render that. Now, one of the hidden gems of this dialogue that most people sort of forget about is there's this thing called adjusting the exposure. And this is especially important when you start doing interior renderings. Because what happens is interior renderings, it turns out are really, really hard to do to get the right light quality. It's almost the same problem you have, like if you're taking photos on the inside of a house, and you have bright windows in the background where the exposure tries to pick up the brightest light in that window and then everyone inside the house is a very dark face that you have to fill in with a flash or something like that. Okay. So often we like to adjust the exposure and you can kind of control the range of the exposure by kind of clicking on this choice down here. Let me kind of pop that over there so we can sort of see both sides. Adjusting the exposure is something you can do to your rendering after the fact. And look what it's going to do is it's just for every individual pixel going to sort of adjust the amount of white value associated with those different things. So if I say adjust the exposure, let me click that. You get this thing about the overall exposure level where if I want to darken it up, I can kind of bring it on down. 
or if I want to sort of brighten it on up, I can bring it on up. And that's, see, far too much. Don't go ahead and use these exposure controls very, you, you kind of tap them lightly. You kind of like tease it along. Don't go ahead and do big gross things or to start to lose things. Or we can even sort of say that for the brightest spots, the really hot spots, the white spots, maybe we'll make them darker relative to it. So you can kind of control what the range is. But if you're into digital photography, this stuff would be pretty familiar. If not, don't worry about it. It just sort of gives you a lot of control. But I like to use these, and you'll be amazed at how much if you, if you have a, an interior rendering that's coming out very, very dark, and you're just not seeing anything in it, you can spend a lot of time trying to add lights and kind of make it fuller that way. But often, just sort of playing around with the exposure control will tease a lot more light out of the rendering than you think. Okay, so just kind of keep that one filed away. In any case, you get done with all this stuff. At the end of it, you save it, uh, the project locally, or we can export it as a JPEG and take it over to Photoshop, whatever it is we want to do with it. Okay, and that's kind of good. But that's just sort of rendering in Revit. But let's go ahead and talk about now how you render and take these sort of things out to sort of higher quality tools so you can get even more power out of this. And where you need to do that, it's really, let me kind of switch back to that default 3D view. What we're going to do is actually just take our model out and take it out in a special file format called FBX. And FBX turns out to be, it's kind of like, oh, it's, it's sort of the Swiss Army knife of being able to kind of carry things around and rendering information between different applications. Because what FBX does is it not only sort of says, here's the geometry of the surfaces, it also carries all the material information. So any material information you've already assigned in Revit, come on over to 3ds Max, or come on over to Showcase, and we use it as a starting point or start making changes and different seeing it over there. Either way. Okay. So how that kind of works is as follows. We get to some sort of view that we like. We say export the view. And the, all the model information is going to come across. Just whatever view you export is going to be the view, the camera position that it's going to open up in the other product. So that's all the real difference. The whole model still comes across. We can save this 3D view as an FBX file. Okay. And I will just go ahead and give it that name. That's fine. Sample House 3D View FBX. Save that away. Okay. That's kind of it in terms of what's going on on this side. I always save it as an FBX file. And now that FBX file, we can go ahead and pick up in, in 3ds Max, as Christian will show you next time. Or I'm going to show you how to pick it up and run with it inside of a, a showcase, either way. But let's kind of take a look at what these tools look like and what the difference is in sort of the rendering experience. Okay, so go ahead and if you don't have that out there, how are you guys doing in terms of your install of showcase? Is it doing okay or is it still kind of in the middle of it or what's happening? It's pretty slow in terms of what's going on. Okay, it's still extracting and stuff like that. Thing. Oh yeah, just go ahead and say install. It's expanding and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Let me just keep going with it, and then you can sort of plug this on your own. I think just sort of watching it sort of is kind of cool. Yeah, I'm trying to download it. It's coming really slow. Do it real slow. Okay, so it's on the all drive, but let me get going with it, just so you have something, and you can jump in as it becomes available on your machine. So I'm going to open up Showcase. So here's the deal. It's the same rendering engine. In fact, most of these things ultimately use the same rendering engine underneath them all. It's just sort of a question of how much control you have over the settings available in the rendering engine. Okay, so we'll open it up. It all starts with this whole idea of really what kind of environment you want to bring your, your uh, scene into. We have what type of file we're going to bring in. We also have what kind of environment we're bringing in. Kind of like a plain gray or white environment or some scenes that have a little bit of environment behind them. As a starting point, let me go ahead and kind of switch over to sample scenes. Now I'm say, oh, now how about this? Let me go to more. I can choose some different ones. There's some architectural ones, things like, oh, out in the middle of a green field or in a desert or something like that. You can choose that outdoor one. And all it is, that's a context. We're going to drop the middle in the, the file in the middle of a giant kind of picture, like a 360-degree picture, so it always has a little bit of background on it. Now, in terms of the file, I'm going to grab FBX as the file type. I will go on out, and you can go out to, when you play with this, to the L drive, under 133, you'll find some examples, and there's that sample house. 
Okay, so it's the one that we just had from uh, Revit. We'll say open that up. It is going to just sort of talk about what it is that we want to go through and import. And I'll just import everything. These are default assumptions for right now. And we'll load it on in there when we can start playing. Okay, so the house model is there. It's a little hard to sort of see where it is right now. I'm going to use my mouse and just wheel on back. So I'm just rolling back. There's kind of the house sitting in the middle of the green field. <laughs> all the items, it's kind of where it looks like the holodeck, with all the grid or the blue grid all over hanging in the kind of floating lines and stuff like that. That's just indicating to you what things are selected right now. Let me just kind of orbit around a little bit. Okay. It may be a little hard to tell, but actually let me kind of unclick on this thing. Escape and... Okay, Shift W will get rid of that steering wheel so I can get back to selecting things. Um, those are fairly realistic representations based on the bitmaps that have been put in here and stuff like that. So here's the basic deal. We have all these different surfaces over here. We have like uh, different materials that have been assigned to them. You can see some things just don't have materials to them at all. We also have some sort of lighting controls that we can sort of play with. Right now, it looks like the lighting is touched on this side of the house and so we can kind of shift around a little bit. Let me orbit it around a little bit and kind of show you how we can do that just with the lighting. Let's get the lighting set up first and then we'll start playing with the materials. So if I want to be looking at this side of the house, it's dark on this side of the house as opposed to brighter on the other side. You can sort of see the shadow on the ground there a little bit. How we control that is under appearance, you'll find environmental light and shadows. And we can play the game of sort of moving around the light in the sky by adjusting the azimuth and the elevation. But one of the easiest things is just to say, just move light. And if you say move light, you can just sort of drag the light around and kind of come up with what you want the right kind of shadow settings to be. So right now I'm kind of very low in the sky. Now I'm high in the sky. Now I'm over on the left side. Now I'm over on the right side. So kind of just set up the lighting the way you want it to be. Okay. Once you have that lighting the way you want it to be, let me zoom on in there again a little bit. Actually, let me show you. I can pan around and zoom into the house. control things there or zoom onto the out of the house. But now is actually a pretty good place where you can sort of see several different materials. Let's just start playing with them. So the idea is, okay, we've got some sort of wooden siding on the front of the house, and we may or may not like that. We want to experiment with something else. So, okay, in the Revit world, we'd say, hey, this rendering doesn't look quite the way we want it. Let me kind of get out of rendering mode, go off to materials, kind of find the wall material, change the wall material, then go back into rendering mode and do it. Okay, here what we do, is let's go to the material library. Oops, let me control that. This little thing, the steering wheel, you shift W to bring it up or you shift W to get rid of it. That's the way it works. Okay, we can go out there and find some materials. There's the materials that are already in here or we can go to the Autodesk materials and kind of load some new ones. How about for that, oh, maybe I'm gonna roll my mouse down a little bit for that wall. If I wanna sort of experiment with what this house would look like in brick or something else, I can go through and choose a pattern, and here's what I got to do. You select the item you want to change, then you choose the material that you want to apply to it. So here I am. Let me kind of just say that I want to put that uh, brick on it. Okay. Doesn't look like it changed much, but if you zoom on in there, can you see it actually is fairly detailed about what the pattern is. So you can change materials by like sort of changing individual things. Let me undo that. Or I can go through and say, with a right click, select all the objects with this material. Actually, it's currently still set to that. Let me do it with that material. Let me select all the objects with this material now. And now I can go through and change it to that. And it'll change them all in a big batch. Okay, same sort of thing. So now that uh, that's not what I want, I'm going to select all these objects with these materials and say, well, what if it's this kind of funny oh, 1960s modern kind of decorative block pattern or something like that? And that that's not kind of what I have in the mind either. Ooh, let's go for some like uh, metal panels or something like that. Put steel, that's pretty boring looking in terms of what's going on there. Siding patterns, that's kind of the one we had. That's a slightly different type of siding. It says metal, oh, it's copper flakes. That's interesting. You see them? They're like, like little uh, fins 
or little uh, 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 yeah, scales, excuse me. Change it to whatever you want in there. Start playing around. But the idea is, you know, there's sort of a fluidity with which I'm doing this that makes it sort of very easy to experiment with materials. Same sort of sense, like here's limoleons on the window there. Let's go and see if we got, got one of them there. Let me select all the objects of those materials. And if I want to start changing around the mullion patterns and stuff like that, again, let's see what we can do. Let's go to, we can either go to metals and change it to there or go to a painted sort of thing. Mm. Let's go to some sort of aluminum. Maybe a nice red, maybe a nice blue, whatever it is we have in mind there. But you kind of sort of start playing around very, very quickly and start to experiment with different things. So. The big thing about this sort of notion of real-time rendering that I really like is that there's just a fluidity to the whole work process that I think works really well to sort of understanding what's going on. Let's go ahead and let's choose that chimney. Same thing, I'll select that. And instead of that, I'll go down to sort of stone and just choose some other type of stone that I want to apply in there and kind of see what it is. Okay, so it's just kind of relatively quick and easy. So, how are you guys doing in terms of your installs? Does anyone have it sort of the point where you well, yeah, it's still working? Okay, for that, just go ahead and choose that you want to do the demo. Okay. You know, just pass that. Okay, most of you guys are still working on that. It's not working. How's this program still going? Does it, so, what does it reduce the web traffic model? Just... It's just sort of the essential surfaces. I imagine it's just taking care of the skins and ignoring all the interior surfaces. But it is sort of the, just the FBX. It's probably doing back face, like, like calling where it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't need to take into account what's, what's not in view. What's interesting, though, is, you know, it is all live in terms of what's going on. So who knows? What's that? In terms of the ability to work with it that way, it'll bring in SketchUp. It'll, in fact, we want to bring in the, uh, 3D, the DWD that you guys played with just a minute ago. We'll see how well it will do with that. But just a couple more things to sure know about it. Okay, so play with materials. That's like its big feature. Go ahead and like mess with that stuff. So even in here, let me get that roof. Let me find some roofing materials that I want to put on it. Mm, I'm going to roll over here, roofing. And three tab gray shingles. That would be a shame. Hang on. Oh, Spanish tile, because of course this looks like a Spanish, <laughs> this must be Stanford. Okay, so we do something like that and put that on there. And there's my Spanish tile. Of course, oriented wrong, but we can probably adjust that in a second. So a big thing is just get the materials on the way you want. And the same thing inside the house, even though I've sort of been playing around outside, you could be inside. And one thing I sort of like about this from this perspective is... I think this actually starts to be, you know, it's kind of not quite as good as the walking through with the whole the telepresence stuff and things that you guys have been doing, like some of the, pre, the PBL stuff, but there's something sort of compelling about this. If I do the look and kind of pack around. Um, the, section box here? the section box is actually, that's interesting. I don't think I can use a section box within here, but that's actually a good question. So there I'm up on the railing looking out into the scene and something like that. So there I'm upstairs. But you, know, you can sort of play around. I think there's just something about this that you know, as we start to have more and more immersive, I think, you know, Christian, you used that term a little while ago. Yeah, you know, There's something very powerful about that because all of a sudden now, I can start having a dialogue with other people who are involved. As opposed to making all my decisions and bringing a bunch of static renderings, which you have to sort of say yay or nay to, I can bring a model and say, okay, well, here's what I sort of had in mind, but let's start playing with it. Well, what if the floor was just a little bit lighter? Well, what if the carpeting was a little bit darker? So, for example, there's that floor. I don't necessarily like that floor. I can choose it. We can go ahead and see if I can find some nice woods. Put some birch on the floor or something like that. Just do something that's a little bit different. That's not a very good representation. I think I need something that has a little more... Uh, like planking to it to kind of make it look good. But oh, I just changed that one to maple. That wasn't very good there. Okay, but so we can start playing with that, even down to things like um, 
you know, the color of uh, whatever that chair is. We can go ahead and change that versus, you know, it's, there's sort of a level of control there that's really kind of cool. That's really much more fluid than what we can do directly within Revit. Okay, so that's a big piece of it. Let's kind of take a look at a color, a whole other things that I think are sort of really, really powerful about it. They're kind of nice. Let me zoom on out to do that. And one is, okay, there's this whole notion of the environment that the thing's hanging around in. So let's take a look at that. Here we are, we're sort of floating around. You'll see I'm actually above the ground, really, in terms of what's going on. I have an environment in the background here. As I have my environment in the background, there's a couple things I might want to do. One is, okay, there's this whole notion of I have the old ground plane, I have this new ground plane. For the purpose of my rendering, it may be good just to backspace out that one, just to get rid of it. Okay, and then even in terms of the ground plane here, this artificial ground plane is coming in. It's actually a little bit low right now relative to where it needs to be. So how I can control those is I can go over to, it's the scene settings. Hang on, let me find it. There they are. That's called the scene. And I can start bringing that thing up. And I can bring the ground up. May I'll just bring it up to zero. I can also change the X, Y position if I want to sort of, uh, oops, me and my bad keyboard. There we go. Let me drop that down just a hair. Okay, whatever it is to kind of do that. I can change the sort of scale of what's going on there in the scene in the background. Okay, or something else I could do is if I want to just try an entirely different scene, I don't want to put it out in the field of Wisconsin, I want to sort of put it someplace a little bit different. I can go to, I have a whole oh, library full of these. Let me see if I can find it again. It's environment library. Okay, so I can put it out on the country road. See what that looks like. Okay. I can put it in the middle of the desert. It's my sort of Route 66 version. Okay. Kind of out in there and start adjusting the lighting and what's going on there. I can put it on the docks in London. Or let's go ahead, we'll put it in the middle of a dry lake. And again, these are all set up. You've got to picture this product was originally designed to put car models in the middle of places and stuff like that. But with a little bit of playing around, I think we can actually come up with some architectural things that are pretty good. And what I like about this in terms of, oh, let's just put it back out in the middle somewhere. It looks relatively green. That doesn't look very good. Pop back over here. Is, to me, the whole notion of the immersion of like being able to kind of see things and be looking around at the outside that way. But also if I'm inside the house to be able to look around Let's see if I can get around there further <laughs> and look out the windows and see something that's reasonable that sort of doesn't kind of keep on oh, what is there? It's, it's interesting about whether that's actually reasonable about what it's doing or not. But I think there's something cool about that and being able to be able to like uh, see out the window and kind of see a little bit of background there and see what's going on. Okay, final thing about this that I want to show you about just to kind of let you know because I think it's like the last cool thing that really is kind of very cool about it is there's this whole notion of basically storing clippings. And let's kind of see if I can kind of uh, get that going for you. It is, oh, compare scenes. I always got to find these things. Store camera shots. Let's talk about that. That is, you can go ahead and store away different places that you want to see really, really quickly. For example, there's a perspective. There's a perspective I want to get to. It looks like an Alpine village now. There's a perspective I want to get to in terms of what's going on. So if you want to go through and kind of create some camera shots, it's actually pretty easy. All you have to do is orbit to some sort of view that you like, and then you can say create. Get rid of that. I'll make a still shot. I can call it whatever I want to. Okay, so I can store that one away. If I want to go through and store that as a shot too, again, I'll say create. I'll make a still shot. Okay, and then I can start knitting these things together, kind of like you do in SketchUp right now in terms of different positions, only kind of all rendered like that. The other thing you can do, though, that's kind of really cool is we can sort of set up more little cinematic effects. Let me just do a start and end where there's a start frame, there's an end frame. Let me, if this is the start, let me reset the end by actually, I have to do my orbiting first. So that'll be the end and I'll reset the end there. So I'll say close that up. 
or I could have previewed it there. But now what's going to happen is, is it that one? Oh, no, that's still. Oh, there it is. Kind of bring it across stuff like that. Or we could do things like, you know, as opposed to just starting and ending, do these things more like zooming in or zooming out or whatever it is that we want to do. So let's kind of take a look at that. If we do a zoom in sort of shot, how does it actually work? It starts here. That looks fine. Let's see what that actually looks like when you preview it. I see it's kind of pulling on in. So that is that you can store, store these different camera shots and kind of go moving through these pretty easily. Now again, to contrast this relative to Revit and what's going on, the nice thing is you know, all those still shots in Revit were pretty high quality, but you really had a hard time kind of getting animations that were rendered. Whereas this is actually doing a pretty good job of giving you, you know, we're moving around in real time and we're actually showing something that's a pretty reasonable representation of the materials. Yeah, Dimi. So you think we can do like snapshots? rendered snapshots from Revit and do walkthroughs in this one? That would it, be easier? Um, I would actually, you know, honestly, for my workflow now, I'm doing almost all my rendering just over here. Because I think it's just sort of easier okay. to work with over here. But it's really yeah, kind I of whatever one you want to. Like yeah. Okay. Actually, let's try just as a start, uh, as a final thing, let's see if we can actually go through and bring in that file that you guys set up, Christian. So if we said new... Okay, so, so don't save that. Detail, like an early stage, how it looks. Okay, so let's go ahead and it's a DWG file? Yeah. Okay, and it's out on the L drive? Yeah, it should be in that same folder with all the... Okay, that one? Yep. Okay, let's go ahead and bring this thing in and see what happens when you bring in that model. Yes. There's a way to basically save all the diffs that you've made to it. So I don't, there's definitely like a linking workflow. In fact, that's going to have to be true in 3ds Max too. One of the things yeah. we're going to get into is whether you link a file or whether you import a file. Because linking means that like any changes will sort of not only have to come through. Let me figure out the exact workflow on, on that one for you because yeah, you definitely want to do that. I keep on making changes. I've made my rendering changes. Yeah, you don't want to have to kind of keep on making them. Yeah. Okay, so let me, let me figure out the, preci the precise parts of that one as we go. Okay, so here we are. Here's the, the form model. So what can we do in here? Let me take that out. Let me maybe just get rid of your ground plane first. So it's just kind of floating around on the grassy field. Here we are. Let's zoom on in there. Let's see what we can do. If I go through and choose something, that's the whole surface right now. Let me kind of pan over there a little bit. Okay, but it looks like it's done it by layers, which is good. I sort of wanted to do it yeah. by layers. So I'll say all this is, and just, you know, for, oops, me and my uh, keyboard again. Materials. So let's go back out there to the material library. I close that up. See, it's flowing. So you're on it. It, it, it's, a, it's a little disorienting, isn't it? Okay, so we'll do something really boring, like just make uh, most of it like sort of brick on the outside. And that's going to be an ugly pattern. That's interesting. Now, here we have a scale problem. Can you see what's going on? I got these gigantic super scale bricks, which is what the pattern is. So there's something about the import I'm going to have to adjust to kind of set the scale of what's going on. But what else is going on then? So then if I have that. There's no way you can uh, go in there and change the tiling or? I think we can actually, but it's, uh, let me see if we can check the material properties. And there's the actual image, the brightness, the positioning, the rotation, the scale. So it thinks it's like four by three in terms of the scale. I think what happened is as part of the import, I probably needed to make another setting, you know, just going to say whether that was in feet or inches. Uh -huh. It's got to be something like that. Just to sort of like, uh, oh, we'll be cheap about it right now. I'll just make it one by one or something. You can like change the, uh, instead of changing material properties, change the properties of the, of the object of itself? The object. That's actually sort of a good question. I'm trying to see I mean, that's just the way uh, we do it in 3D maps. Exactly. You would want to go through and just don't know enough about where to do that. So let's kind of like put that in there as like one of the things to kind of check on. Uh -huh. is sort of the relative scale of that. 
I bet it's part of the imports where we sort of got ourselves in trouble. But let's go ahead and just kind of put one other material in there. Oops. What I have to do is choose that, choose that, choose that. So then you're kind of okay. So short of the scaling problems, though, and our scene, see, it's, we're a little above the ground right now and stuff like that. It's not bad. You know, it's, it's not great, but it's not bad in terms of what we need to do. And again, I think there's just sort of a, a fluidity that I kind of like in terms of what's going on. But again, to your question, the whole notion of really, now that we start with this basic form, what happens now when we start adding the windows and we sort of break out the curtain wall in more detail? We want to sort of like be able to kind of like do that and carry the choices forward that we've already made. So how about this? Just, you know, we have a couple different sort of questions in mind, like you know, how we scale the DWG properly so that we can get it in there right. And how do we do the workflow so we're linking and it keeps on going. Let me kind of take those issues back and see if we can come up with some good kind of suggestions about how to do that and bring that back to you next week. But in the meantime, please feel free to download this on your own machine, play with it a little bit, sort of get a feel for it, because it's one of those things, it's more than half-baked right now. It's, it's, it's pretty far along some dimension. We don't understand everything about it yet. There's something so compelling to me about just being able to do this quickly and immersively that it's like, you know, I'm willing to learn what those next little steps are to kind of make it work, because... I just like rendering in this a whole lot better. Is there any like adjustments to form you can do in this? Is it? Is it's it's just strictly uh, yeah. Strictly Although for, rend for visualization, it does have one set of things that sort of are good in terms of form, and that is this whole notion of it's alternatives, and I got to find them in here too. You can set up alternatives, and what are alternatives? Alternatives are things like, for example, we can turn on and off different pieces of the form, or we can separate and move different pieces of the form, so you can illustrate several different concepts. So, for example, if you have this building like this, and with the gazebo, and you want to turn that off and have something different over here. So, you can change pieces of the form, you can change the position of the forms, or you can change the materials being illustrated. And that way, you can search for the red car versus the blue car, or the car with the doors open versus the car with the doors closed. Or in our case, you know, different things that you want to show architecturally, like state one versus state two, for some sort of dynamic structure. So let's just kind of leave it up there for today to kind of tease it, but go ahead and play with it. We'll kind of see if we can get a little, uh, you know, just have a little bit of fun with it. And we'll try and come up with those answers again about the, the DWG scaling and the linking workflow. Yeah. Oh, in terms of bringing data? Um, I brought a SketchUp file in here. I think we did it as a DWG. Okay, because it's pretty much the same thing where it's just a bunch of surfaces and partition points. So I think that's my current best way is that, but I think it's going to have the same scaling issue. So scaling DWG, definitely a big issue. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and break for today, and we'll have some more good stuff for you next week.